Hey, he's so mad at me. He called with Jack Hot. Welcome to the channel. Yes, I'm back. It's time for Where Are They Now? Poker Stars from the 2000s. This is part two. Uh, if you haven't seen part one, I encourage you to go back and take a look at it. Uh, you don't have to do it before this. You can do it after it, whenever. They're all different players. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, before we start, I wanted to thank everybody who liked and commented and subscribed after the first video. Uh, the comments really helped me because they gave me a whole new list of names to choose from. And I think you're going to see over the next couple videos that a lot of your suggestions are going to be added to them. So I appreciate the comments. And if you do enjoy the video, I'd appreciate it if you would click like and subscribe. YouTube likes this stuff. We just got over a thousand subscribers. So we're getting monetized, which is really cool. And again, I thank you for that. And I appreciate the continued support. He called me with Jack High. It's a phrase that's still used in a particular way today. And it's all because of Alex Powers. I can't do the phrase justice. Most of you probably can't do the phrase justice. He called me with a jack high. <laughs> but it's something that we think we're saying the right way. Whenever we get into a conversation with someone and we talk about that hand that we were in that somebody called with jack high, we're kind of like, you know, it's, well, let me put it this way. If somebody calls you at the table with queen high, you just kind of like, oh yeah, he, you know, deadpan like me. Yeah, he just kind of called me with Queen High. But if they call you with Jack High, you always have that inflection in your voice. And again, it's because of Alex. When Alex Powers came to the World Series in 2004, he had already hit the bottom of the barrel. And he was doing everything he could to try to pull himself back up. At one time, he had a normal, kind of what you would consider a normal life. He had a wife, he had a kid, he had spent some time in the military. And then all that kind of turned into drugs, despair, and a life of uh, homelessness. But through all of this, Alex was known as somebody who knew how to play limit hold them pretty well. Not top tier play, but he could hold his own and he could make some money doing it. So, you know, friends encouraged him to keep playing. As Powers found religion and tried to give up uh, some of his other vices, uh, his friends were encouraging him to try, you know, take a stab at the World Series. So in 2004, he headed to Binion's in downtown Las Vegas and he did just that. He took 19th place in the $1,500 limited event. And between his winnings there and some uh, backing from friends, he entered the $5,000 event. And in that event, as we know now, he made the final table. If you recall, back in 2004, ESPN actually made an effort to show a few more games besides No Limit Hold'em. So the $5,000 limit final table was one that they wanted to show. It featured, you know, several well-known players for, you know, people in poker circles. Uh, the most well-known was probably Johnny World Hennigan, who wound up winning the event. But of course, what we know Alex for was his confrontation with uh, poker author James McManus. In addition to writing several books on poker, McManus is probably best known for entering the 2000 main event and making the final table where he eventually took fifth place. McManus flat out didn't like Powers' antics at the table. He thought he was being disrespectful to the game, and Powers really seemed to have McManus on tilt. Now, in McManus's defense, ESPN didn't show everything that was going on at the final table. Powers was pretty much belligerent to all the players. He was belligerent to everyone. Um, he had been out partying the night before, and he literally could not focus on the cards. As a matter of fact, the infamous he called me with jack high was actually he called me with queen high because that's what it was. It was a queen high hand that McManus called with. Uh, Powers just couldn't focus on the cards. That's how bad it got. My own personal opinion is that I don't think McManus fully appreciated where Powers had come from and what got him to that moment. Uh, yeah, he was hungover for sure. But if you think about everything that had gone on, the, the life of homelessness, the, you know, the divorce, all that he went through, uh, the addictions, those kind of things, you know, that final table was kind of a culmination of, you know, I'm coming back, I'm doing something with my life. You know, and I'm having fun doing it. And and maybe he didn't handle it the right way, but I think McManus just kind of glossed over all that because he just he just has this romantic ver uh, vision of poker and how poker should be, and failed to realize that you know there are many many different types of personalities in poker. So the result of the tournament was that uh, Powers came in seventh. He made just over forty grand. Uh, McManus came in fourth. Sadly for Powers, uh, it didn't really help his life condition. After the 2004 World Series, he kind of went back into his old habits. He had uh, 
his addictions, his homelessness. Um, he had ill health, uh, and he really was kind of living off the charity of others. He occasionally returned to the poker tables of Southern California when he had money to play with. When Powers died of heart failure on September 11th, 2015, James McManus said, I'm sad to hear of Alex's passing. He was a decent, funny man who had an extremely tough life in LA and Las Vegas. The endlessly replayed clash between us is probably the low light of my poker career and the highlight of his. Alex Powers was a good man who deserved to make more final tables and many more days in the sun. Everyone knew Dave Elliott as Devilfish. If you didn't know, all you had to do is look at his hands. On one hand, he had a ring that said devil, and on the other hand, he had a ring that said fish. He made those rings. He was straight out of a crime novel or a Guy Ritchie film. People loved Devilfish because he was the real deal. He didn't fall into money and reinvent himself. He was always his true self. After leaving school at 15, Devilfish discovered gambling, first with horses, then in pool halls, and he was active in the criminal underworld. He worked with a team of safe crackers, and one time he owed bookies 5,000 pounds, and so he robbed them. Between the ages of 20 and 30, Devilfish spent several months in jail for theft and fighting. Poker had always been a part of Devilfish's life, but it really didn't take off for him until the early 90s. He played in legitimate casinos, and he also played in underground games where you had to worry about your personal safety if you won. After one private game, Devilfish brandished and then fired the gun that he carried with him on such occasions. His first appearance at the World Series of Poker was in 1997. After burning through nearly $300,000 in cash games and buy-ins, Devilfish won the $2,000 Pot Limit Hold'em event. He continued to play cash games in Vegas, and he left that year with $750,000 that he and his friend carried around in bags. He had pretty good success in the early years of the WPT. He eliminated Phil Ivey to win the Jack Binion Poker Open in 2003 and he cashed at or near the final table in other events. For many of us, watching Devilfish play heads up with Phil Helmuth was priceless. To his credit, Phil really didn't seem to be intimidated by Devilfish and would just kind of, you know, be Phil. But Devilfish, to his credit, didn't put up with Phil's antics and he would call him out every time. Devilfish's strength was in Omaha, and unfortunately, as TV became more No Limit centric, you know, we didn't get to see him as much as I think we could have or should have. As the years went by, Devilfish kept the rings, but he kind of got rid of the sunglasses and the bad boy image. He told a British magazine, I was at a party in Vegas and everyone looked the same as me, so I was like, fuck this. He also wanted uh, the reporter to just call him Dave. Dave passed away on April 6, 2015 from colon cancer. He was 61 years old. Where to start with Doyle? The Godfather of Poker has done it all. Although gameplay and strategy are much different today, his book Super System is still considered a poker bible for many players. As a youth in Texas, Doyle excelled at basketball. He had an opportunity to go pro, but an injury kept him from doing so. When Doyle got his knee injury, he started playing poker. He played five-card draw, and then he started playing seven-card stud. Once he realized he was making more money at poker than he was not uh, being a salesman, he uh, gave up sales, just focused solely on poker. Most of you have probably heard the stories of Doyle's early years as a poker player. Doyle played throughout Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and often he would play uh, with Amarillo Slim and Sailor Roberts. They played in underground games and they had the same security issues we just talked about uh, with uh, Devilfish on both sides of the pond. People get ripped off at poker games. Who'd have known? <laughs> Doyle played these games for several years and then eventually decided to move to Las Vegas. He first played in the World Series during its first year, 1970. He won the main event in consecutive years, 1976, 1977, and he came runner-up to Stu Unger in 1980. To me, the best statistic about Doyle Brunson is that he's cashed in the main event in five decades. That's longevity. But Doyle's career is not without controversy. In 2005, he made an offer to buy WPT Enterprises, which happened to be the publicly traded company that owns the World Poker Tour. The Securities and Exchange Commission believed that Doyle hired lawyers and a PR firm to make the announcement public about the, uh, the bid on the WPT. And you're not supposed to do that because the result of that is that the stock price just shoots way up artificially. That case was eventually dropped, but not before Doyle asserted his Fifth Amendment rights and also um, invoked uh, attorney-client privilege, preventing his lawyers from testifying. 
for the WPT, when the um, SEC investigation came to light, the stock went down and plummeted. So first it was artificially inflated, then it tanked. And of course, that meant that investors were out millions of dollars. Now at 89, Texas Dolly is retired. Occasionally he pops up at events and he almost played in the 2022 uh, WSOP main event, but he had a number of concerns about COVID that was spreading through the event and decided it was best to keep everyone at home healthy. Former poker dealer and longtime player Mike Matisau is probably best known for his trash talking and emotional outbursts at the table. People have strong opinions on Mike. They kind of borderline on, you know, either love him or hate him. Not a lot of middle ground there. But one group that loved Mike were TV show producers. They loved having him on because they loved his personality at the table and the fireworks that would sometimes ensue. It was, you know, it was kind of like reality television. He was invited onto almost every poker broadcast and ESPN would feature him often. His infamous blow up at the 2004 main event is still talked about. Eventual winner Greg Raymer kept his cool while Mattisau self-destructed in dramatic fashion. Mattisau was arrested in a drug sting where he had uh, provided ecstasy and prescription painkillers to an undercover uh, police officer that had you know, befriended him. Mike spent six months in jail after reaching a plea deal. Um, he returned to the poker scene after his stint in jail and he had a pretty good run. He still trash talked but his game seemed to improve and he had some pretty decent scores. He made the main event final table in 2005 and he eventually came in ninth place. He won the WSOP Tournament of Champions in 2005 and he took third place in 2006 in the same event. He won four WSOP bracelets in four different games. Mike also placed highly at several WPT tables. He won a, uh, uh, a season of Poker Superstars, if you remember that show. He won one of those. And he also won the NBC National Heads Up Tournament in 2013. Today, at 54 years old, Mike still lives in Vegas. He still plays. Um, he has a YouTube channel, and he also has a podcast. So check him out. In part one of this series, I profiled Chris Moneymaker, who kind of started the poker boom in 2003, when he won the uh, main event. Also mentioned briefly was the Goliath that he had to get past in order to win the main event. That Goliath is Sam Farha. Farha was born in Lebanon in 1959. His family had to leave the country because of civil war and they settled in the United States. Sam earned a degree in business and he spent a lot of his free time playing pool. Supposedly, the legend has it that he also made about $5,000 playing Pac-Man. Waka waka waka. In the 80s, he took up poker, and like many of the older players that pop up on these lists, he became an Omaha specialist. He's won three WSOP bracelets, and each one of them came from Omaha. The 2003 main event final table almost didn't have Sammy. On day two, he was down to about 10% of the average chip stack, and only Barry Greenstein could convince him to stay in the tournament. So the rest, as they say, is history. Regardless of how you feel about Sammy's play or Moneymaker's play, both of them had a major impact on the history of the game. Sammy didn't play many tournaments. He was primarily a cash game player. So when the cash game shows like Poker After Dark started popping up on TV, it was always a real treat to see Sammy come up. His cool demeanor and his willingness to gamble made him a fan favorite. In a 2017 interview with Poker News, Sammy said that his, you know, he still plays a little bit, but that his days of you know, the high stakes and being in the limelight are behind him. Like many of the players from that time, Sammy just grew tired of the scene. So now let's turn from someone who wanted to be low-key to one of the most entertaining players the game has ever known. 1998 WSOP champion Scotty Wynn is simply a legend of the game. Not always for his gameplay, but certainly for his, his showmanship and his adoration from the fans. Scotty was born in 1962. His mother wanted him to get away from Vietnam because of the war that was going on at the time. And so she sent him to Taiwan, where he stayed until he was 14 years old. Then he was uh, accepted into a sponsorship program where he got to live with a family in uh, Southern California in Orange County. Scotty had a tough time adapting to his new life in America, and he wound up getting expelled from school because he was focused too much on cards and not on his studies. Scotty became a poker dealer, and he spent his days either dealing cards or playing cards. Eventually, he became well-known among the high-stakes cash players in Las Vegas, and he built himself up a significant bankroll. For a time, he lived in Caesar's Palace, and he started to enjoy the high life a little bit too much. 
Drugs and alcohol contributed to Scotty losing his bankroll, and he had to turn to his friends for help. Scotty kind of went through this existence, the, you know, the ebb and flow of having money, losing money, having money, and he went into the 1998 World Series broke. Mike Matisau staked a third of uh, Scotty's satellite buy-in for the main event, and Scotty got into the main event, and when he eventually won, he repaid Mike one-third of his winnings, which was $333,000. So Scotty is best known, I'd say for my own personal opinion, he's best known for two events, one good, one not so good. On the last hand of the 1998 main event, Scotty told, uh, famously told Kevin McBride, you call, it's going to be all over, baby. And I did not do that any justice. You call, going to be all over, baby. <laughs> uh, McBride did call because there was a full house on the board, but Scotty had a better full house, and Scotty won. Scotty also won the 2008 $50,000 horse championship. Unfortunately, in that event, his behavior wasn't so good. Scotty drank. He drank a lot. He drank throughout the whole event. He uh, went after other players. He berated the wait staff. It was just a really, really ugly scene that he eventually uh, apologized for. That incident aside, most people find the Prince of Poker to be approachable and a nice guy to talk to. Scotty still plays. Um, as of the making of this video, he has four caches with Player of the Year points in 2022. And the last information I have on him is that he still lives in Henderson, Nevada. Not everyone on these lists are known for their prowess at the table. Shauna Hyatt was extremely well known and loved in the poker community for A, being Shauna Hyatt, and B, for her work as a presenter on uh, many poker programs. Prior to hosting on the World Poker Tour, Shauna was probably best known as the 1995 Miss Hawaiian Tropic. She and several other of the Hawaiian Tropic models then posed in Playboy magazine. She was known for that. And she also had a career as an international model. Her marriage to James Van Patten, Vince's brother, helped lead to her getting the WPT hosting gig. She and James divorced in 2005, and she married producer Todd Garner that same year. She worked on the WPT for three years. And then she hosted uh, Poker After Dark and the NBC National Heads Up Poker Championship on NBC. The WPT tried to prevent her from moving to uh, NBC. They, uh, they claimed that she had a non-compete clause with the WPT. Shauna sued them because she said she didn't have one. She didn't sign one. And she also said that there was a lot of tension on the set and all with uh, her uh, new husband uh, being around. Apparently, the Van Pattens didn't care for the new guy. Hyatt won her suit, and that allowed her to move to NBC, where she stayed until 2008 when she got pregnant. Since leaving the poker hosting world, Sean has been focusing on her family, and she also uh, plays a lot of online poker. Occasionally, she pops up at various events. So that's it for part two. There will be a part three. And as always, you know, I appreciate your comments. Let me know. I know some of you have a lot of names that you want to see, and I want to get them in there. And, you know, we have uh, plenty of videos to come with more of our uh, Where Are They Now players. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, like, subscribe, and I will see you next time.